good morning, church. Let's try that again. Good morning, church. There we go. I know y'all still sleepy from the fourth and all the fun you probably had, but today is a good day to be in the house of the Lord, uh, to sing of his praises, to celebrate the good things that the Lord has done for us because he has been good to us. And so we celebrate that this morning. I want to say good morning to those of you who are here in the warehouse, to those of you who are in the chapel, to those of you who are in our plaza area, and to those of you who may be watching us virtually, thank you so much for being here uh, with us, even connected wherever you are today. I'm excited. We're continuing our series in the book of Proverbs. My name is Justin Bilson. If I haven't met you yet, one of the teaching pastors uh, here at Fellowship. And uh, each week, our primary responsibility as teaching pastors is to teach. And so week in and week out, uh, Fellowship is one church in six locations. And so uh, usually if you don't see me, that's because I'm teaching at one of the other campuses. I promise, I told first service, I promise I'm not at home doing puzzles. Uh, and just sitting at home in my pajamas. But uh, each week we're at different campuses, and so uh, I'm glad that I get to be here uh, in West Little Rock this morning as we walk through another uh, installment of our series in the book of Proverbs. And so I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, wherever you read God's Word from, let's go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to focus our attention on verses 12 through 19 uh, today. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. Now, just to remind you or to make you aware, if you're just joining us in this series, we have been walking for the past few weeks through several Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, several uh, sections of scripture chapters uh, or portions of chapters uh, in the book of Proverbs. Normally, when we walk through a book of the Bible, it is our custom to go through the entire book, chapter by chapter, uh, but we're not going to walk through all 31 chapters, but rather this time, we're just going to highlight a few different Proverbs. Proverbs that we love, some that you may be familiar with, some that you may love, some that you may not be as familiar with, but I love this series. I was getting so much good feedback even uh, in between services, not just here at this campus, but at all the other campuses, that uh, this series speaks very practically to where we are and to what God wants us to know. And so I'm excited that we're going to continue uh, today in Proverbs chapter 6. So again, we're going to look at verses 12 through 19. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, and so I want to us to listen in, lean in uh, to what the writer says here in Proverbs chapter 6. He says these words, a worthless person, a wicked man, goes about with crooked speech, winks with his eyes, signals with his feet, points with his finger, with averted heart, devises evil, continually sowing discord. Therefore, calamity will come upon him suddenly. In a moment, he will be broken beyond repair. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. This is the word of the Lord to us today, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12 through 19. Today, I want to talk about a word to the wise. That's what I want to talk about today, a word to the wise. Let's pray and ask God's blessing over our time in the word today. Father, thank you for the joy that is ours today to be in your presence, knowing that in your presence there is fullness of joy, that you strengthen us, that you lift us in your presence. And not only are we lifted, not only are we encouraged, but we are in awe of your presence. That we would never get so common or so familiar that we lose our sense of awe and wonder of being in your presence. Knowing that we are sinful and broken and should not be allowed in your holy presence, but because of Christ... As we've placed our faith in his finished work on the cross and have been redeemed and washed with the blood of the Lamb, thank you that we get the joy of being able to stand in your presence, to sing of your goodness, to lift our voices, our hearts, and our hands in praise to you. Thank you for this day. It is a gift. The hours and the moments and the seconds that you've given us today, we want to use in ways that bring and honor you and bring you glory. So, Father, thank you for the fellowship that we've had. Thank you for the worship that we have participated and engaged in together with those around us. And now, Lord, we quiet our hearts and sit at your feet and ask that you'd speak to us. Thank you for your word. 
In times like these, we need your word, your truth to stand on, to stand under, to be led by, to be guided by. Thank you that your word, as the psalmist said, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you that your word is still speaking. All we need to do is listen. I pray that your word would confirm some things today. I pray that it would challenge us today. I pray that it would encourage us today. And I pray more importantly that it would convict us in the areas that we need to grow. I pray that your word would do its work in our heart today as we seek to understand and make sense of this text here in Proverbs chapter 6. Lord, we love you and we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I've said this throughout the series um, at, at each of the campuses, but I want to reiterate this again, that I am convinced, wholeheartedly believe that the book of Proverbs is essential, is important in the life of every believer. Because it not only helps us to learn how we are to acquire wisdom and where the source of wisdom is, but it helps us to understand how to apply that wisdom to our everyday lives. Proverbs establishes this central principle that we saw in Proverbs chapter 1, that wisdom comes not from more learning, not from more study, not from more degrees. Wisdom comes from God. Because Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning, is the doorway to knowledge. This is what the writer of Proverbs teaches his readers. This is what this father is teaching his son. And there are so many hidden theological gems that are scattered throughout this book, some that we're going to cover and consider today. But before we do, let me remind us, or if you're just joining us in this series, let me make you aware of what a proverb is. Proverb is a, a practical truth that is related to various aspects of daily life. It is, it is said that it comes from the, the, the ancient practice, the, the historical practice of leaving in, in ancient Rome. The, the Romans would leave milestones along the roadside. They would inscribe the number that the journeyman had to travel, had left to travel, and they would put a question on the milestone to give them something to think about along the way. That's, that's in many ways what a proverb is. It's a practical truth to give us something to think about and consider and then to apply, to know how to apply that to our everyday life. Proverbs, according to the text, was written primarily by King Solomon. He was the primary writer of the Proverbs who, according to 1 Kings chapter 4, was known throughout the world for his great wisdom and his Proverbs, short, memorable statements that, that some would even suggest, according to 1 Kings chapter 4, that he said audibly or wrote down or inscribed some 3,000 Proverbs in his day, many of which are recorded here before us in the book of Proverbs, which is framed and is written in the format of a letter from a father to a son. Now, the purpose of these Proverbs, in case you were wondering, if you recall, if you were here with us in the first week where we talked from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 2 through 6, it teaches us the purpose of Proverbs. It's to give wisdom, give instruction and understanding and prudence and knowledge and discretion and learning and counsel to the young and the wise. This is what we see throughout the book of Proverbs. And what is interesting to me is not only do we see various themes, but we also are introduced, I don't know if you know this, we're introduced to five, literally between chapters one and nine, we are introduced to five different types of people. Chapters one through chapter nine of Proverbs, we are introduced to five different types of people. What, what do you mean, Justin? Let me, let, me, let me help you to see what the text says. The first person we're introduced to in chapters one through nine is the wise person. The wise person is the individual, yes, who has knowledge, but also understanding and also skill and, more importantly, the ability to know how to apply what they know. They're committed to walking in obedience to Scripture and to the Word of God, and they understand that the true source of wisdom is not more knowing from my part, but it is the true source of wisdom is God. He is the source of wisdom. It's not just me knowing more information. True wisdom comes from God, the wise person. But then we're also introduced to the foolish person. Interestingly enough, historians teach that the word fool comes from the Latin word folis, F-O-L-L-I-S, folis. It comes from the Latin word folis, which means bellows, or it gives a picture of one who has their cheeks full of 
heir. The idea here, the, the picture it gives is one who walks around as if they've got it all together. They've got everything. They know everything. They're good. But internally, they lack substance. They seem full, but internally, they lack substance. The foolish person. Then we see the simple Person. The writer would argue that this person is naive. Uh, some would even say that you see the simple person and the young generally tied together, not that, that he is suggesting this in terms of trying to offend, but what he is arguing is that you're naive and you're young because you're still formulating your own beliefs and your own convictions, and so you are the person who will believe anything and everything because you're still working out what you believe for yourself. He talks about the, the, this person, the, the wise, he talks about the, the fool, he talks about the simple, but then he also talks about the scornful person. Now, what's interesting about this person is this is the individual who brings harm to themselves and others because of their arrogance. They are the ones who think they know everything there is to know about everything. They, they always want to one up the person next to them. They, they, if, if you've got a house, they've got a better house. If you've got a car, they've got a better car and multiple cars. They always want to one up. They're always arrogant. They are the person who will never achieve true wisdom because they're not humble enough to learn and listen. Scornful person. But then in chapter six, we're introduced to a really in chapter two, but in chapter six, we see a portrait of a wicked person. Scornful, the wise, the, the fool, uh, the, the simple, but now the wicked person. The wicked person is not only described as sinful and corrupt, they are also described as rebellious. And one part of the Hebrew word translated there for wicked literally means without profit. Without profit. We, we see a portrait of this wicked person here laid before us in Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 12 through 15, because the author is describing for the reader, the father is describing for the son. Here is this evil person. Here how I, here's how I would describe them. Here's the type of individual they are. Here's what happens to them. Here's how their life will end up. Why is he writing this to them? He's writing to his son to help him understand, even though he doesn't specifically say it. He's writing to him to help him understand you're, you're going to encounter somebody like this in your life. You're going to come in contact with this evil person at some point in your life. So son, here's what I want you to do. Make sure that you don't hang around them. Make sure that you're not influenced by them. And for everything in you, make sure that you don't become like them. Don't become like this evil person. Why? Because he says in the text that the evil person is worthless and wicked and deceitful with their words and untrustworthy in their actions. Why? Because their heart is evil. They walk in sin and darkness and because of the corruption of their heart, they desire to cause conflict and stir up strife and division. And that's why, again, he is very clear in the text in describing them and their end and how their life ends in ruin because he wants to warn his son and the reader, even you and I today, of being mindful to avoid this person at all costs. Because at the end of the day, they will bring irreparable harm to themselves and others because the text is clear that their life ends in ruin. That's the portrait of this evil, wicked person that we see here in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12 through 15. So he describes the evil person, and then the, the, the implication here or, or the inference is, I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to stay away from this. I want you to avoid this type of person. And then in verses 16 through 19, he shifts his attention to now giving a list of the things the Lord hates. His list of the things the Lord hates. Hates. It, in, interestingly enough, any, any time I hear this word hate, I, I can still, uh, uh, even, even in my mid-30s, I can still hear my mother in the back of my mind telling me, Justin, don't say you hate something. Hate is a strong word. I can still hear my mother saying it. Today. I, said, I said it to my son this morning when he was convincing me that he hates Brussels sprouts. I said, son, you've never had Brussels sprouts. How do you know you hate them when you've never had them? Just say you don't like them, right? You know, we want to soften it because hate is a strong word. But here's the reality, church. I cannot soften the text for us. There, there's no way for me to soften this and say, well, he kind of doesn't like them. Maybe you shouldn't do it. No, the text is clear. It says the Lord despises these things. He despises, he hates haughty eyes. Haughty there is, is, is prideful eyes, a, a lying tongue. 
Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Church, these are the attitudes and actions which the Lord hates. And, and, and as we look at this list, two things I want to I make note of. The first is that this list is not exhaustive. That this is not an exhaustive list to suggest that, that there are only seven things that the Lord hates, that the Lord despises. Because I'm sure if we were to really sit and study this text, we could say, well, what about this? And could we add this to the list? And yeah, I think that makes sense. So at the end of the day, it's not an exhaustive list. He's presenting this list to the reader, to his son, to show him, here are some of the major things that you will see if you study the scriptures, what the Lord despises. I want us to know this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a list to help us see here are some of the major things. And, and if you study scripture, you will see these talked about often. The other thing I want us to make note of is, and this is important, I believe that while this list is numeric, I do not believe that it was written in order of importance. I do not believe this was written in order of importance. And the reason why I say that is because generally, anytime we see a list of numbered something numbered one through seven, the assumption is that whatever is numbered one or whatever is listed first is more important, or in this case, more deadly or more uh, something that is to be more avoided than anything else on the list. Well, well, Justin, couldn't you argue that the reason why he puts number one as as pride or haughty eyes is because God despises the proud and, and, and God hates pride? And couldn't you say that pride is one of the most deadly things that, 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 that can impact and can destroy the life of a person? Well, yes, you could argue that. And that is true, that God despises pride. But here's the thing I believe the author is arguing. I would suggest to us, church, that he is not suggesting that numbers one through six on this list are more or less important than number seven. Number seven is this idea of sowing discord among the brothers. I would argue that the author is suggesting to the reader, to his son, even to us today, that numbers one through six leads to number seven. Justin, prove, prove, prove that to me. Here's, here's how I believe we should see it. Here's how I believe we should see it. If you look at Numbers 1 through 7, he says, Prideful eyes, a lying tongue, hands that, that, that murder, that hurt and harm others, an evil heart that is corrupt, that has corrupt intentions, feet that are always quick to run to the wrong things, being an untrustworthy person who is known for rumors and gossip, all of these things that he mentions in the text. Yes, these are all things the Lord hates because they dishonor him and they lead ultimately to division and disunity in the body. I would argue that that's what he's suggesting. He's not saying that pride is, is more deadly than sowing discord. I would argue that what he's suggesting is that all six of these things, if you look at them, they boil down to, they add up to causing discord and division. And that's important because one of the major themes in the book of Proverbs is unity. Because you do know that wisdom does not just come to help us make good decisions or pat ourselves on the back and say, look at how smart I am. Wisdom comes to help us walk in obedience to God's word and to make sure that we are living in unity with one another. So at the end of the day, I believe this is what the author is arguing. So now that we have a better understanding of the text, here's the question I want us to ask and answer in the few moments we have together, and that's this. What words of wisdom can we glean from the teaching in Proverbs 6. What, what words of wisdom, what practical points of application can we take from this teaching in Proverbs chapter 6? A couple of things that I want to raise for our uh, thought and consideration today. There are actually two major points, and then there's, there's two underneath those. But, but the first one there, it's on your bulletin. If you have it, it's on the screen as well. But the first thing I believe this text challenges us to do is to consider the lesson to consider the lesson. Proverbs chapter six, if, let, let me just, as, as an aside, say this, if you've never read Proverbs chapter six, I encourage you in, in your time this week and whenever you make time to read scripture, re read Proverbs chapter six, especially verses one through 19, because there is so much in those few verses. That the writer talks about the, 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 the danger of making hasty promises. He talks about the danger of laziness. He talks about the end of the wicked and even the behaviors and attitudes that God hates. 
There's so much that we can learn from chapter six, but, but I just want to draw our attention for a few moments to two lessons that we should consider right here under point number one, two lessons that we should consider. First one is found in verses 12 through 15, and it's this, that as believers, we should commit, look at this, to walk in integrity every day because deceitfulness and dishonesty will destroy our lives and relationships. Let me say it again in case you're writing it down or in case you didn't get it the first time. Believers should commit to walk in integrity every day because deceitfulness and dishonesty will destroy our lives and relationships. Okay, Justin, how, how, did, you, how did you get that out of verses 12 through 15? It, it's just, to me, it just looks like a description of an evil person. How, how, how did you get that out of, out of this? Well, well I'm, I'm glad you asked. I, in, in my research and my study this week, I, I ran across an author in one of the commentaries I was studying, and he suggests this. He said, anytime you're reading Proverbs, which, which is filled with imagery and, and, and allegory and all these different word pictures and all these different things, it can be hard at times to understand what the author is really communicating. So here's what he said. It's not on the screen, but let me read it to you. He says that the best way to understand what the writer is saying or to find the lesson, here's what he says. You need to identify the value and the vice, the value and the vice in the text. Because when we identify the value that the author highlights and the vice that he warns against, there we will find the lesson. So the lesson is found when I see the value that he's highlighting and the vice that he's warning against. So let's look again at this passage and see if we can apply that strategy. He says a wicked person goes around with crooked speech. It means they can't be trusted to tell the truth. He then says something interesting. He says he winks with his eyes, he signals with his feet, and points with his finger. What, what, what's, what's going on here? What, what does that mean? The idea here is that it's suggesting a person who may be talking to someone, and while they are talking to that person, they are gesturing or signaling to someone else around them who they are going to conspire with against the person they're talking to. The idea here is that this person is so evil that they're not only going to do something evil towards that individual, they're going to involve other people in the plan. They're manipulative. They're conspiring to do evil. Why? Because their heart is evil and it is perverted. And the text says that they continue to sow discord, division, confusion, strife. And in the end, their life will come to ruin. They will be, as the Bible says, broken beyond healing. The idea here is not just their soul, but even their relationships will be broken beyond repair because of what they've done. So what is the value here? So if we're looking at that strategy of value and vice, I would argue that the value here, church, is integrity. Integrity. Because Christians, as believers, as those who name the name of Christ, as those who follow him and his word, we are to be people of integrity. Proverbs chapter 11, which is actually the sister text of Proverbs chapter 6, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 3 says this, the integrity of the upright guides them but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. Church, if we want to be people who walk wisely, and I believe we do, then we must understand that it is our job to value integrity, to walk in integrity, because if we don't, we will be influenced by the vice of deceitfulness and dishonesty. And, and let me say this real quickly about deceit and dishonesty. You do know it starts off small, right? Right? It, it starts off small, a little lie here, a little half-truth there, a little manipulation here. It starts off small, but then it snowballs, and it gets bigger and bigger, and eventually, not only are you lying to everyone, you are now lying to yourself. As a result, you damage your life and your relationships, and so that is why we must be a people who are marked by and walk in integrity every single day, in public, yes, and in private, with family and with friends, in church and in the marketplace. We must be people of integrity. That's the first lesson. Second lesson, I love this, is found in the application of the words here in verse 16 through 19. Here's what I believe the lesson is. Commit, look at this, to live humbly, honestly, and truthfully, because God hates a prideful attitude, a lying tongue, and a deceitful heart. 
Let me read it again. Commit to live humbly, honestly, and truthfully because God hates prideful attitude, a lying tongue, and a deceitful heart. There is so much in that statement. And we could spend the rest of the time in this sermon unpacking that alone. But here's what I want to do. I want to zero our attention in on one word there, and it's the word humbly. Or I'll even say it like this, the word humility. Because again, if we keep that framework of value and vice, I would argue that the value here that we need to see from this text is walking in humility. When it comes to humility, I, I don't know if you uh, were, were, grew up like I did. I, I would often hear this, this, this phrase in my house uh, growing up with my mother, my grandparents. They would say, Justin, you have to be humble. You have to walk in humility. And I, I, I once heard someone say that, that humility, the idea here is that you're not thinking less of yourself, but you're thinking about yourself less. Right, the, the idea that I'm not self-centered, that I'm not self-self-indulged, that I don't think the world revolves around me. I'm walking in humility. I, be, I gotta be honest with y'all, church, that, that, was, that was hard for me because I was raised as an only child and this is not an indictment against only children, but let's just be honest, we as only children tend to be just a little selfish, just a little, right? We don't wanna share, everything is ours. We've never had to share. Those of you, my wife, Sharita is, is the oldest of three girls. She's always had to share. I have not had to share. So when we first got married, she wanted to share. I didn't wanna share at all, especially with my food. Why are you in my plate? I just want some of your food. I will order you your own. I don't want my own. I want yours. Why are you in my plate? I, I didn't want to share. And, and y'all said, well, have you gotten better? I'm, it's a work in progress. <laughs> and now my children are in my plate. So that's even worse, right? But the reality here is, again, the idea behind humility, yes, I would argue that this is true, that it's, it's not being self-centered. It's thinking of myself less. I'm not thinking of myself all the time. Or I would even say this, I'm not thinking that other people are always thinking about me all the time, that, that the world revolves around me. I'm not self-centered in that way. And yes, that is true. But can I push it a step further to argue that Christ-like humility is more than that? Christ-like humility is not, oh, I just think of myself less. I don't think of myself all the time. I'm not being self-absorbed. No, no. Christ-like humility is arguing that I think of myself in light of the gravity of my sin and the glory, the glory of his holiness. I think of myself in light of the gravity of my sin and the glory of his holiness because when I do, it forces me to humbly acknowledge the truth that I have been the foolish person. I have been the one who walked around with those cheeks puffed up with my heart and my attitude puffed up thinking that I had it all together trying to make everybody around me think that I was all good when in reality I knew that I wasn't. I was the scornful person who was driven so much by pride and arrogance and my desire to be something that I wanted to prove myself and show everybody, even God, that my works and my behavior and all the good things that I've done are good enough. I've been the wicked person who was sinful and corrupt and rebellious. And you know the thing, church, the reality about our story, many of us, we can acknowledge the truth and humbly say that we were those types of people. We were that person. And here's the reality. We would still be that person if it were not for the grace of God. We would still be that scornful person. We would still be that wicked and that hateful and evil and corrupt person if it were not for the saving grace of Jesus Christ who washed us and redeemed us and made us new. And can I say that if you're here today or you're watching me live or even, even the playback and you know in your heart that you are not the person that you need to be or want to be, I promise you, and I've got a room full of witnesses who can testify that we are not who we were because Jesus saves the scornful. He saves the wicked. He saves the foolish person. But what is required of us is to humbly kneel before the cross. Because at the end of the day, I cannot pick up my cross and follow him without first kneeling before his cross and saying that I am a sinner and I am in need of a savior. I cannot save or fix myself. My works are not good enough. I need to trust in someone and something greater. And so I got to put my trust in Jesus Christ because his finished work is enough. But at the end of the day, church, remember the value, value and vice, the value is integrity. The value is humility because if we're not careful, the vice is deceit and dishonesty. That's what the writer here is warning the readers about. Let me, let me give you just one more and we'll be done. Consider the lesson, number two, adopt 
the practice. Adopt the practice. Two things very briefly that I, I just want to give you. Um, these, these are not new things necessarily. These are just reminders that I want us to consider. Um, but, but two very brief reminders. The first one is this. Wise people, look at this, wise people seek to add value to those around them. Wise people seek to add value to those around them. Um, the, the word value stems from the word profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, profit. It's interesting that, that, that we know that because if, if you look at the translation of the word wicked, I told you that early in the message, if you look at the word wicked in Hebrew, one of the, uh, one of the translations, their definitions is not just rebellious or evil, but it means without profit. The idea here is that a wicked person's life profits nothing good. But a wise person's life profits much. Why? Because they understand not only how to add value to those around them, but they also understand where their value comes from. My value is not assigned to me or my value is not in what I have or what I drive or what I wear or where I live or who I know or what I have accomplished. My value is given to me by the one who created me in his image and sent his son to die on the cross for my sins. He is the one that says I'm valuable because I belong to him. Not because of what I do in society, not because of the accolades. All those things are great and wonderful, but my value is found in him and him alone. I recognize where my value comes from and I recognize that it is my assignment to add value to those around me and I do that by showing unconditional love. I do that by giving grace and walking in grace. I do that by being willing to go the extra mile. I do that by committing to stand with those that I love and those I'm in community with when things are good and when things are hard. Knowing that there will be some times and many of us have been there where words are not needed, but your presence is enough. Sometimes, let's be honest, people are going through stuff, and maybe you are going through something right now, and you need the people in your life. You don't need to talk. Some days you don't even have the words to formulate, to say how you're feeling. You just need somebody to be there. That's how we add value to one another. That's how we display the character of Christ. But can I ask you this before we move on? Consider this. How have you added value to those around you lately? How have you added value to those around you lately? Again, the idea here is this, this is not a, let, let, me, let me see how I can pat myself on the back or let me ask my family members, hey, how have I added value to you so you can make me feel better about myself and tell me all the great things that I'm doing? No, it's to challenge us to internally consider how, or let me rephrase the question, are you adding value to those around you? Are you adding value to those around you. Why? Because wise people seek to add value to those around them. Let me give you one more and we'll be done. Not only that, but the text also shows us, here's another practice. Wise people, look at this, seek to display God-honoring, grace-driven body language. God-honoring, grace-driven body language. Justin, that's an interesting statement. Yes, it is. Um, it, it's a weighted statement. I, I'll admit it's a lot of words. Uh, I, I, I'm a, a communications major undergrad, so words matter to me. And I rewrote that statement like eight times. It was a lot longer than that, so I tried to whittle it down. But, but every word is intentional there. And, and what I want to draw our attention to, just for the sake of time, is that last phrase, or the, those last two words, body language. The reason why I say that is because um, one of the authors that I read this week, he suggests, and I love this, he says that the author is highlighting the body language of the wicked. Notice the text. He is suggesting that the author is highlighting the body language of the wicked. What do you mean, Justin? If you look at the list that he gives, those seven things that the Lord hates, not only does he give the list, but he also attaches a body part to each of those things. Notice he says, look at the text, eyes, tongue, hands, heart, feet. Each one of these things has a body part. Why is he saying this? He's arguing, he's suggesting, I believe that a evil person, a corrupt person is evil and corrupt, what? From head to toe. They're evil from head to toe. That's the body language of the wicked. So if that is true, then my question to us to consider today is what is the body language of those who walk wisely? 
What is the body language of those who walk wisely? I believe it is to have eyes that are humble, that see ourselves and others as imperfect individuals who are broken and in need of the grace of our Savior. To have a tongue that builds up and does not tear down, that does not spread rumors or gossip, but that tells the good news to the lost. To have hands that are busy serving others in the spirit of kindness. To have a heart that wants what God wants and feet that are willing to go the extra mile for the sake of the kingdom. That is the body language of the wise and that is what our world needs to see because at the end of the day, even if I never say anything out of my mouth, what does my body language show you about God? Because you do know you don't have to say a lot to say a lot. So here's where I want to close. My challenge for us this week, church, as as strange as this sounds, but consider this. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to commit this week to be more mindful of our body language. What, 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 are, what are my hands as I use my hands in service? What, are that, what is that communicating? What, what, where I go, the direction of my feet and the words that I say out of my mouth, what is my body language communicating to those around me? Because I don't want to be like that wicked person that my head down to my feet communicates wicked and evil and rebellion. But I want to be, since I've been transformed by the grace of God, I want to be one who communicates that, not just with my words, but with my body language. Because at the end of the day, I believe we're called today to be people whose actions match our confession. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the needed and necessary reminder today to be more mindful of our body language. As the writer describes this evil person and lists the seven things that, Father, you hate. First of all, I ask if there are any of these things in us that you would remove them. If there be any pride, if there be any arrogance, if there be any, any, any air about us that says, I can do it in my own strength and my own power, whatever there might be in us. As my grandmother used to say, Lord, would you shine the spotlight of heaven on our souls? Would you remove anything in us that is not like you? Thank you for the reminder today, the encouragement today to know that we are to walk in integrity. Our world needs to see a different picture from the church. There's so much brokenness in our world and they need to see. You have called us, you have sent us, placed us in this world, a home that is not our home, that we are not designed or called to live here forever. We have an eternal home in heaven, but while we are here on this earth, we want to continue to be light, be people who are marked by integrity, people who value humility, who know that wisdom does not come from more learning, more study, more books, more education, but it comes from you. And that we would live in such a way that our actions match our confession. We want our words and deeds to line up, Father. We need you and we can't do that without you. We ask these things and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for listening to the Word of God. We are blessed to reach you throughout the week through whatever platform you're listening on. If you're needing prayer or you want to talk to someone about your walk with Jesus, reach out to us at fellowshipar.com slash contact. Have a great week.